Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining our event today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nat Cohan, the president of C2ES, the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. We are very excited to welcome you to for today's panel, which has a really extraordinary lineup of speakers uh, who you'll be hearing from for the next 90 minutes. Um, it's a timely panel as well. We've seen so much these past months, these past few months, in terms of the impacts of climate already bearing down around the world, heat waves, fire, uh, wildfires, hurricanes, uh, and more. Um, and yet we have one month till the COP, till COP26, at where, where so much is expected. We've seen the IPCC report in August. We saw the NDC synthesis report uh, just last week. And of course, we're seeing climate commitments from all sorts of countries as we head towards Glasgow. What does this all mean? And what is it going to add up to? And will it be enough to get us back on track? We couldn't have a better panel to hear from today. So I'm going to turn it over to Kaveh Glampur, who is the VP for International Strategies at C2ES and will lead us through. Kaveh, take it away. Thank you very much, Nat, and, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kaveh, and as Nat said, I lead the international work at C2US, and we're working with EDF on a project looking at how the Inevitable Sea Global Stocktake and Paris Ambition Cycle can most effectively help to raise ambition. So C2US and EDF are really pleased to welcome you to today's discussion on climate ambition for COP26 and what comes after Glasgow. Uh, we are very excited to welcome a world-class panel of leading thinkers in the field of climate action. A link to their biography should now be posted in the chat, and although they require no introduction, formalities dictate that I do just that. In order of speakers, we have Todd Stern, a non-resident fellow of the Brookings Institution. Todd served from January 2009 until 2016, is a special envoy for climate change at the Department of State. He was President Obama's chief climate negotiator, leading the US effort in negotiating the Paris Agreement. Todd is currently focusing on writing about the climate negotiations his time as a, his, during his time as Special Envoy. Rachel Kite, who I'm, I'm hoping uh, will join soon if she hasn't done so already, is Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She's the first woman to hold that position and prior to joining Fletcher, Rachel served as Special Representative to the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All. Before that, she was the World Bank Group Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change in the run-up to the Paris Agreement. Rachel is a member of the UN Secretary General's High-Level Advisory Group on Climate Action and advisor to the UK Government for the UN Climate Talks. Cassie Flynn is an internationally recognized expert on treaty negotiations and serves as a strategic advisor on climate change to UNDP's administrator. She is head of UNDP's climate strategies and policy team and head of UNDP's climate promise, an, initi an initiative which supports the enhanced climate action in 119 countries, including through NDCs. Gonzalo Munoz is high level climate champion for COP25. Previously, he co-founded and led Triciclos one of the most recognized Latin American companies in circular economy and recycling. He is currently an advisor to the National Water, Green Hydrogen, Electromobility and Circular Economy Committees. Baroness Brownie Worthington is a cross-bencher member of the House of Lords, having spent a career working on conservation, energy and climate change issues. Brownie has previously worked at Friends of the Earth as well as for Scottish and Southern Energy when she was seconded to the UK government on the design of the pioneering 2008 Climate Change Act. Bryony previously served as shadow spokesperson for energy and climate change. Her current roles include co-chairing the cross-party caucus peers for the planet and devising grant-making strategies for Quadrature Climate Foundation. Richard Kinley is president of the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability and former deputy executive secretary of the UNFCCC. Richard was intimately involved in the development of the UNFCCC Secretariat as an organization from its establishment through to 2017. He oversaw the Secretariat's support to the climate change negotiations, including the Kyoto Protocol and the historic Paris Agreement. And last but definitely not least, Lavanya Rajamani is a professor of international environmental law at the University of Oxford 
specializing in international environmental and climate change law. She serves as coordinating lead author for the IPP, IPCC's sixth assessment report, and she's also served as consultant and legal advisor to the UNFCCC Secretariat and was part of the core drafting and advisory team for the 2015 Paris Agreement. So we really do have a fantastic lineup uh, and we really hope that you will engage in, in our conversation as the audience. Before I want to let you know as our audience that you can make observations and exchange ideas via the Q&A function that should be available somewhere on your Zoom panel. Uh, anything that you post can be liked and upvoted by others and uh, comments and questions will be moderated. If we have time, we may put some of these to the panel towards the end. And I should also uh, note that the event is being recorded and will be made public afterwards. So with those formalities, I'd like to begin by turning to Todd and Rachel to set the high level political scene for where we currently are on climate ambition, what expectations are for COP26 and what we are likely to need to see in terms of climate action beyond Glasgow. So turning first to you, Todd, things have changed a lot since COP21, haven't they? The Paris Agreement entered into force several years early. The US withdrew and rejoined the Paris Agreement. Earlier this year, we saw the G7 commit to net zero emissions by 2050, and we saw a strong statement from G20 climate ministers. In recent weeks, we've seen reports from the IPCC and the UNFCCC that show that the world is way off track for staying within the 1.5 degree limit of Paris. But this week, we saw President Biden pledge to significantly increase climate finance and China committing to stop financing coal overseas. So over the last five years, things have changed a lot. But do you think, Todd, that we're beginning to see the necessary leadership on climate from the major economies? What more, what more do you want to see from them before COP26? Uh, thanks very much, Kave, And uh, thanks to uh, Nat and uh, for um, uh, hosting this event and great to see all of my fellow uh, panelists. So I'm um, pleased to be here. Look, I think that we are um, starting to see some of what we need to see right now, um, not uh, by no means all. I think that those uh, big uh, reports, particularly from the IPCC and particularly uh, not just the reports, but what people are seeing and experiencing all over the world uh, has led us to a moment where, where it, it, it is probably the case that people feel that climate change is upon us now. It is not, it is not one of those things that is coming, uh, it is here, um, which I think is, is quite important. With respect to what's happening, I think that, um, that uh, I, I look at them in the first instance at kind of the big three, which I you know, regard as the US, EU, and China. And I think with regard to those first two, uh, yes, we're doing uh, a lot, lot better. Um, in, in the, the pledges, of course, the focus this year is both on uh, essentially the, the commitment of countries to the longer range goal of uh, net zero by 2050, but then even more so now, particularly in regard to Glasgow, uh, the uh, concomitant commitment that needs to be a part, part of, uh, of any real commitment, which is what are you going to do now in this decade by 2030 in order to make uh, to keep 1.5 alive and to make um, net zero in 2050 possible. So you see those pledges from the United States uh, and from uh, the EU. Uh, the uh, challenge obviously is gonna be implementation, challenge for both countries or both the, the EU and the US. Uh, EU always has a lot easier politics than we do in the US, but I think that, um, that the Biden administration is absolutely flat out on this. Um, climate change is not is not siloed off in any way. It's part of their whole overall uh, uh, plan and part of these the two large pieces of legislation that um, that they are working very hard to get done. I think it's going to be um, it's going to be a stressful few weeks. I do think they'll get done, uh, not in their complete form, but I I think in a good form. The outlier right now, I think, is China. I mean, and Xi Jinping made a useful statement last year during UNGA uh, uh, to um, pledge to, to reach carbon neutrality before 2060. That's not quite what we need, but it's definitely in the right direction. But China's really held back on, uh, on saying anything that's meaningful with respect to ramping up in, uh, in, uh, in this decade of the 2020s. I think the statement, uh, Xi Jinping's statement the other day about 
um, curtailing uh, new building of coal on the on the Belt and Road and uh, abroad is is welcome, but and, and, and is very much welcome because there's been massive building. <laughs> it's better. It's sort of a better late than never uh, pledge, but. Um, but we've got to see more from China uh, in this decade. They're twenty-seven percent global emissions, and we can't we can't keep one point five alive if China just sits on sits where they are uh, for this decade. Thanks, Todd. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned China in particular. I mean, uh, just just two questions, if I can be provocative. I mean. Firstly, uh, China pushed back, if I recall, uh, uh, in, in recent weeks and made the, the point that um, when they commit to something, the world can have confidence that it will deliver on its promises right. and, and sort of provoked that that may not always be the case of the US. How much confidence do you have this time around that the, the, world, that the world can, well, how much confidence do you think the world will have that, um, that President Biden's promises will be seen through in the coming years? Well, I think the biggest thing, uh, the biggest step with respect to uh, to that issue is uh, is getting the legislation done that 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 is um, getting, uh, you know, kind of uh, hacked through in uh, in both the House uh, and the Senate. Uh, and at the moment, uh, with with quite a struggle among different different factions of the Democratic Party, but I do think that that's going to happen. Uh, I you know it's it's not going to be every single piece that we want, I'm sure, because those things never happen. But I but I I do believe that 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 that's going to happen in terms of you know the sort of the larger question of where do, what you know where does the U.S. go in the next presidential election? Um, that's always impossible to uh, to um, to predict. But uh, I do think the Biden team is uh, is going to get. Uh, a big part of what uh, they've been seeking, and I think that they're quite mindful of uh, of trying to put actions in place that will be difficult to reverse. So, look, I the the notion that you've got to worry about implementation, absolutely, that's right, that's fair, and the U.S. always gives people um, a lot of heartache in in uh, in watching the process, uh, but. But that doesn't excuse China from not doing what they need to do. I mean, it's great to say you're going to implement what you've what you've put forward, but in the context of where we are right now, there's been a huge shift, as we all know. The, the goalposts have moved considerably since Paris. Uh, the, the imperative of trying to, to hold to 1.5 is, I think, clear to most people. So to say, well, don't worry, we're going to implement what we said we were going to do, but what we said we were going to do is going to keep uh, you know 13 or 14 gigatons coming out of China for the next you know nine years. That's just not good enough, uh, and they can do better. Um, you know, one one thing that we all saw, one lesson from COVID is, uh, you know, that it's, I, I sort of talk about this in in terms of the phrase compared to what. Well, we couldn't possibly shut down a city of 10 million people overnight because you know, look what that, that would do to the city's economy. Look at the jobs, look at the companies, look at the this and then that and the other thing until you have to, and then you do it. And that we have to, so we're gonna do it moment has not come yet uh, for China, but, um, but the, it is, it, I think it's really important that the right kind of uh, call from around the world, not just uh, in, the, in the US or Europe, um, uh, be made and, and be heard in China. And, I mean, uh, in, in the years running up to Paris and, and even afterwards, you developed a very close relationship with Special Representative Shea, who was Minister Shea at the time. Uh, I'm seeing reports that, um, that uh, Special Envoy Kerry is planning another visit to China again before COP26. If that's, if that's true, do you, do you see that as a positive development? Can we be, is that a sign for, for hope for COP26? You know, I got I, honestly, I have no idea. I, I, I mean, I think that that Secretary Kerry um, and his team are uh, are doing their best. I think there there have obviously been a lot of conversations between the U.S. and China. It it, it doesn't sound to me like a bad thing if he's going back again to to talk to uh, Minister Shia. And I, and Minister Shia, by the way, I have uh, the greatest respect uh, and warmth for. I mean, we're we're good friends. I think that he is uh, he is committed uh, to the cause. Um, he's also part of the overall Chinese system. So, you know, you, you can, uh, he, he's going to do what, you know, what the, what the overall um, decisions uh, dictate uh, there. But 
I, you know, as, as to whether Kerry's gonna, you know, he's gonna accomplish something, uh, or or this does this suggest that something's in the works? I mean, you know as well, you know as well as I do. I just I don't know. Thanks, Todd. And, and just briefly before turning to Rachel, I mean, looking beyond Glasgow, it's, it seems pretty clear that the COP26, even if, if it takes us a long way, isn't going to get us all the way to the 1.5 limit. Are there opportunities on the horizon for G20 countries and others to show leadership beyond COP26? I'm thinking particularly around the Paris ambition cycle that you were so close to. Yeah, working. sure. Well, I, you know, I think that the the, the ambition cycle, um, something that uh, that our, our late great friend um, Tony de Bruyne used to talk about a lot, uh, is is really quite critical to the Paris Agreement. Every five years, for countries to uh, sub, to uh, review their individual targets and hopefully ramp them up. And then the staggered every five year global stock take, first one being uh, in 2023. And I, I think that's, yes, that's an important moment. One of the things that I think is, is really uh, enormously important in the, the accompanying decision uh, to the Paris Agreement uh, was about the global stock take and says quite explicitly that, that, that part of the information that needs to be reviewed to inform that stock take is the latest IPCC, IPCC science. And I think that that notion of the science being looked at dynamically is, is, is again, enormously important. I mean, yeah, Paris's main goal is, is well below two degrees uh, with the best efforts at 1.5, but Again, the, the, the sense of the kind of consensus sense of the climate world has just shifted a lot. I mean, there were some people who were already there in 2015, but most were not. Most are now. And, uh, and so I think that global stock take uh, is really, really important. And before, before ending, I just want to say one <laughs> positive thing, which is there's a really, really important, I think, uh, paper just came out of the Oxford Institute uh, for New Economic Thinking, and it and it uh, basically lays out uh, how rapid and effective this transition could and should be. Um, I think, with the caveat that I would add to that, if we can get the, the uh, get over the hurdles of political economy, and I will turn it over Thanks. to you. Thanks, Todd. It's, uh, it's always friends. good to end. <laughs> always good to end on a positive. Um, so, thanks. Turning to you, Rachel. I mean, similar questions to Todd. Really, are we on right on the right track towards achieving the Paris Agreement goals? And you know, when you open your newspaper on the day after COP twenty six, what headlines would you want to see to show that Glasgow has been a success? Well, if I open the Daily Express, I suppose I'm going to see pictures of Wombles. Where, um, but but <laughs> more um, more more seriously, um, I, I think that the, the the COP is actually coming at a really um, separate from the process of the COP, it's coming at a very interesting time because uh, as Todd said, you know, climate change is upon us and that is beginning to sort of filter through. But he, he also said, you know, um, the moment hasn't come yet in China that this, is, um, that this is at the heart of geopolitics. I think for the last year, you know, we, we'd hope that the economic world and the climate world would converge a little bit more closely because of the UK joint presidency and the Italian joint presidency. And, you know, I thought we, I think we hope that the sort of build back better world might be inspirational. It, it hasn't really happened. We're, we're on the edge of a, a great divergence again, which is really the context in which most developing countries are coming to COP, right? They can't access vaccines. They're debt distressed or they're uh, in liquidity crisis and that this has really sort of put a spanner in the works of sort of this trust that has to be built and I think that you know whereas China you know is still unclear about how it's going to manage its own domestic way forward I think I don't think Europe is there yet I mean we, we we've got all the right sized ambitions for the next stage but as soon as you start talking about energy prices going up or somebody having to do something a little different then you start to get a really difficult politics and everybody's saying, oh no, we can't go so fast. And in the US, you know, we have a political system where Joe Manchin gets to decide whether my 16 year old is gonna have a bright future or not. I mean, if you were an alien and you came down and you looked at these three blocks, you would say, well, we're still in a world where we're talking about geopolitics and climate. We're still not in a world where geopolitics is fully understood to be taking place in the context of, of climate. 
So then what is possible of the COP? Well, we're not going to meet the ambition that we wanted to. Um, it's become the end of coal COP, and I think that there's lots of good things that have happened there, but there's still the implementation. But so if we have had prog progress on stopping coal, we haven't yet had the sufficient progress in funding all of the green, and that's still work to be done. And, you know, Todd said about China, well, better late than never on funding coal in the BRI. You can say better late than never that, that Biden comes to the General Assembly this week and makes a sort of, you know, attempt at a solving of the 100 billion problem. I mean, it still isn't enough. Um, and so we're still really uh, not, I think, across the finance issue, either in terms of meeting past promises, ramping up public money for future promises, and then really dealing with the financial issues of adaptation, resilience, and loss and damage. So huge amounts of work to be done. And then if the race to zero has been fantastic and has let off all kinds of extraordinary possibilities and real excitement, then we know that that's a race that has to have guardrails so that um, we're, we're not making false claims and we're not uh, uh, having a hyperbole and sort of losing track of whether or not we're helping the transition or whether or not we're helping finance flow to those who most need it. So I think that when you open that paper on that next day, it's going to be, well, you know, some things are now more closely in place. Some things are in focus. Maybe we'll have had successful Article 6 negotiations. I don't know. Um, but it's going to be not only that there is a massive to-do list, the to-do list is really the very difficult issues that go to the future architecture of how we govern the global economy and how we manage the relationships between power blocks, which have much to argue about at the moment while we still need to cooperate. That's, um, that's re really helpful, Rachel, and you raised a lot there. I mean, I, I'd like to pick up um, in particular, if I may, just on the finance point that you raised uh, amongst the many other issues. I mean, you, you, you work closely with the Secretary General and also with the COP presidency, and the messaging from both has been very strong on the 100 billion, and also on the 50-50 split between adaptation and mitigation. And there seems to be progress towards each, which I think, as you said, is, is critical for trust building. But as we know, um, and as everybody, the, the mantra is, it's, it's about the trillions and um, not, not just the billions. And that sort of alignment of the geopolitics with the, the climate regime. Do you think enough has been done yet or what could be done at the COP to really sort of start mobilizing this, the, the flow in the real economy, this sort of, if you get into the weeds, the Article 21C of the Paris Agreement talks about aligning global financial flows with the mitigation and adaptation goals of the agreement. We're really not there yet, are we, on, on that? No we're, we're, no, we're not there yet. Um, and I think, I don't know what Richard's going to say, and I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to interfere in his pitch, but um, we're now at the point where this stuff is, is being dealt with elsewhere as well, right? So th this is really uh, a conversation uh, around um, how uh, the developed world manages its economies, the access to markets for developing countries, the, the trade regime, uh, making sure that uh, we've got an alignment, of, at least on, in, in the West, about how we do things and that nothing that we do that is aligned between the EU and the US would actually make it more difficult for developing countries to participate in the global financial markets or the global trading regime. So these conversations don't take place at COP, but that's what we really need. Now, at the same time, we have made progress, I think, on the 100 billion. The 100 billion for the UN, this, this is really uh, the, the, the article of faith around um, you know, the, the common, what was common but differentiated responsibilities now is, you know, sort of code red for the planet that, that everybody has to do their utmost um, in order to uh, put a break on where we are. But then we really do have to have this sense of solidarity. And that's what the Secretary General has talked about consistently. And that's what is in his common agenda is how do you rebuild solidarity? And what does solidarity look like in a world that is now shaped by climate change? And I think there's a lot more work to be, be done there. And then within the financial markets, I think there's extraordinary innovation. There's lots of possibility. There's going to be big announcements from uh, the banking sector, and you'll see ratcheting up of announcements from all of the other parts of the financial sector, from insurance and asset owners and asset managers, more people coming into the mix, more assets under management being 
uh, framed within, within a net zero. But now we have to, in a, in a world of hybrid governance where the UN doesn't set the rules and neither does the, uh, do the Bretton Woods institutions, we, this is where we will have to agree very strict uh, guardrails for ourselves so that um, when, we're, when we're building, whether it's voluntary transparency and disclosure or voluntary carbon markets, that we are operating with the highest levels of integrity. So that if a claim is being made, then that claim is understood to be something that can be uh, framed within the science pathway, uh, that that is a claim that actually helps us move towards 1.5 and helps facilitate financial flows to those who need it most that uh, an asset is actually an asset and can be discoverable either by a sky, an eye in the sky or through machine learning and that the governance of those systems is held where every country can get to see the sort of registry as it were. So we're in a new era of building new financial architecture for a decarbonizing world where financial flows move to those who need them, uh, but we're gonna have to do it in hybrid form with the private sector and government and civil society participating together. It's a whole new world out there, it's exciting, but we have to hold ourselves accountable. Thanks, Rachel. I mean, just listening to you, it really strikes me that the sort of meta narrative that's coming across from what you're saying is that there needs to be a transition from the sort of negotiating uh, world of, of the UNFCCC to a different dynamic that, that pulls in the real world economy and transitions towards something different. I mean, looking ahead beyond Glasgow, do you see uh, any particular milestones um, on the horizon where that could be used to accelerate that transition? And thinking also particularly about the ambition cycle under the Paris Agreement and the sort of global stock take process. Could that be a, a nexus where some of these different dynamics come together or is it is it really about action outside? I mean, I know that Gonzalo and Richard will touch on some of these issues, but it will be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think in 2022, I think there'll be progress on, well, there either will be progress or not on, um, on the guardrails for the voluntary carbon markets, uh, depending on what is negotiated in, in, uh, in uh, Glasgow, then that is an either a, a, a medium term or, or, or long term, depending on the negotiation sort of on ramp into regulated markets, hopefully in most parts of the world. Um, hopefully, in 2022, you start to see more effective carbon pricing through all kinds of different mechanisms. Uh, hopefully, in 2022, you, you see um, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions and uh, all of the regional development banks and other development finance finally coming to terms with what it means to operate development uh, in a world completely shaped by climate. I think that there's still a long way to go and there's lots of shareholder conversations to be had there. And then I think it's also a year where you're going to see some really creative uses of philanthropy, uh, working with private money and then with government money to try to sort of perhaps pump, prime the pump on the need to invest in the green. You, you know, the, we spend a lot of time saying there shouldn't be any coal and there shouldn't be this and there shouldn't be that. And I think that there's a legitimate, uh, dis legitimate discussion about how do we uh, move quite quickly to allow countries to be able to exploit that which is possible. So I think those things are, are, are all there, um, but um, how much of our attention is gonna be focused on this when you've got uh, so much sort of great power rivalry, distraction, and presumably a very long tail to this pandemic if we don't move forward uh, with a global vaccination program. There's lots, of, there's lots to distract us, and this has to be at the heart now of the geopolitical discussion. This is Liz Truss's job, not Alex Sharma's job, although Alex's done an extraordinary job and will continue to do so for a year. And that's the shift that has to happen. Can yeah, just thanks, Rachel. One, Go ahead, Todd, please come I, I, I just want to say that I agree completely with Rachel on, on the on the finance issue. I mean, I think it's it it it's the hundred billion for a starter, but that but it goes way beyond that. And I think it's crucial for the thing itself, which is that that uh, developing countries need that flow of capital, but it's also crucial to ambition. I mean, the two things go together and, um, and mm -hmm. the capacity to, to reanimate a kind of coalition of progressive and, uh, and vulnerable countries with uh, many developed countries um, for the kind of ambition we need is completely wrapped up in being able to create a new financial uh, system, which I think it is going to need the, the buy-in of leaders and the execution by, by finance ministers, along with the international institutions that Rachel 
uh, talked about. This is not a thing I think that happens within the COP, the, within the Conference of Parties, but it, 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 but it, it goes directly to benefit the Conference of Parties. So I, that, that's sort of how I see it. Many thanks, but uh, both of you really appreciate it. And Rachel, you mentioned the voluntary carbon market. So I think I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to advertise that that's definitely an area that we're going to be looking at very closely in, in CTS. But thank you both very much. I hope that you'll be able to stay on. I know, Rachel, you need to leave a little bit earlier, but um, you're very welcome to stay as long as you can. And Todd, please do stay until yeah. the end. Thanks. So um, thank you very much for that. We're going to now look more closely at the role of key stakeholders in implementation in the course of climate action. And um, looking, uh, well, turning first towards Cassie from, U from UNDP. Cassie, when people talk about ambition, the focus understandably tends to be largely on the G20 countries needing to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But climate ambition is about more than that, isn't it? What, what more do we need to see from COP26 other than that enhanced mitigation from the major economies? And what's UNDP focusing on? Thanks, Kaveh. And, and it's such a pleasure to be here um, among all of these distinguished panelists. Um, you know, something that I think and kind of building on what, what Todd and Rachel are saying is that, you know, COP26 and action on climate change is happening in a, in a really particular political context. And we're seeing this play out, not just in terms of the G20 and the dynamics of the G20, but we're also seeing this outside of the G20. And, you know, at, at UNDP, we have this program called UNDP's Climate Promise, and we launched this on the margins of the Climate Action Summit in 2019. And the idea was, was pretty simple. It was, how can we help 100 countries to be as ambitious as possible when it comes to their NTCs? And 2019 seems like a million years ago now, uh, given everything that has happened in the world since. And um, what we've been able to do then is, is try to really take stock of what's been going on when it comes to NDCs on the ground. And we've seen a couple of things that, that really, really matter. And while the conversation often kind of gravitates toward these big politics of the G20, we're seeing some really important moves being made by countries that aren't in the G20. And this is really important because the decisions that countries are making now are going to influence the G20, even when they're not considered a big emitter. And, and I think Guyana is a really good example of this. They have discovered oil. They're a nation that's less than a million people. And they're right now in discussions with Exxon about what to do about this oil. And this will have a profound impact on their development trajectory and their ability to reach net zero by, by 2050. And so thinking about some of these lessons and that these things that we are seeing um, right now within countries that maybe don't get the spotlight of the G20 is, is really critically important. Um, and you know, with, with the climate promise, and I've, I've brought a couple uh, visual aids here just to show some of the data that we are, that we are seeing um, on the ground for countries. Uh, the climate promise is 119 countries. Um, it's about 30% you know, of global emissions. And it cuts across small island states. It cuts across LDCs. We've got some higher emitters in there. We've got uh, many countries in fragile settings. And we are trying to really figure out how countries can be as ambitious as possible within the context in which they are, they are operating. So Philip, can you, can you switch it to the, to the next one? Because I want, I want to show some, some trends here. And, and these trends are actually quite promising. And they follow a theme that we have seen sort of over and over and over again, which is the smaller and vulnerable countries are stepping up. And within the climate promise, you know, these, these 119, we have 56 countries that have submitted so far, it's about 83% of all developing countries that have submitted so far. And you can see some of these numbers on, on the right hand side, 88% have increased mitigation ambition in their second generation NDC compared to their first. 95 have increased adaptation, 96 are, are acknowledging gender, 95 have standalone energy targets, more than half are linking to COVID-19, and 75% are prioritizing youth. And underpinning all of this is a step up in higher quality, 
better data, detailed costing. We are seeing countries make these, make these moves. And I think it's a real testament to the potential of this ratchet mechanism of the Paris Agreement that, you know, Todd mentioned this, this, you know, every five years we have these NDCs and this, of course, gets us on this net zero pathway. And I think we are seeing countries start to make good use of this. Um, we aren't, of course, seeing it as uniformly and as quickly as we need to see it, but there are some really promising signals. Next, uh, next graph, please. And then I just wanted to give you a, a, a quick insight here because we've also been um, doing this, this sort of comparison between sort of vulnerable countries, LDCs and SIDS, and comparing that to where higher emitters are. And the reality is we are seeing LDCs and SIDS, 90% of them are increasing mitigation ambition, 97% are raising adaptation ambition. And I think a lot of this also has to do with what, what Todd and Rachel were saying about the fact that the climate crisis is here. It, it is on our doorstep and countries are seeing that they need to do things as rapidly and at speed and scale as, as they can. But when you compare that to higher emitters, the numbers drop quite a bit. 59% of higher emitters raised mitigation ambition and 86% raised adaptation ambition. And it's this dynamic that we're really entering into COP26 um, that sort of gives us sort of the, the context of the conversation that, that has to happen. Because of course we have this dual reality where we may see SIDS and LDC stepping up, but we need everyone to do so. We need the higher emitters uh, to be able to reach, reach the goals of, of the Paris Agreement. So those were just my, my visual aids that I wanted to share. Thanks, Cassie. And that, uh, really a phenomenal amount of work that UNDP is, is doing around the world. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. And I was really struck in particular by the strong showing of adaptation action in there, because the, the focus at the moment rightly is on climate finance and the 50-50 split, but there's there's a lot of work to be done in terms of policy development and, uh, and, and, and also solutions in relation to adaptation. So are you seeing um, innovation in some of the NDCs around adaptation as well? Is that a strong focus on the, in terms of the implementation side and, and will we see work on both mitigation and adaptation beyond COP26. What's, what's the future for the climate promise after COP26? Mm -hmm. Well, I think too, you know, sort of thinking back to, to the Paris Agreement and negotiations and thinking back to the conversations around NDCs, there was so much of an emphasis rightfully on mitigation and how these NDCs are a vehicle to, to reduce emissions. But also what we have seen, and I think this is exactly what, what everyone's saying, is that because climate change is on our doorstep, this, this real acknowledgement that adaptation needs to be happening quite urgently and countries need to scale up their efforts on adaptation quite rapidly is, is just the reality of, of how we are going to exist in the world. And with the IPCC telling us that really, even over the next 20 to 30 years, this, this reality is locked in that the moves that countries make to try to increase their resilience are, are really more important than, than ever. And certainly with the climate promise, we, we've seen this trend play out. We, we have seen this uh, really, really evolve. We've also seen this, I think, in the context of COVID and thinking about resilience of societies and communities when crisis strikes. And COVID, I think, has taught us a lot about what it means to be vulnerable and what it means to sort of have these crises sort of come at, coming at you with a frequency and intensity that hasn't been seen before. And so I think, you know, as we're thinking about the next phases of, of the climate promise, we've, we've also been trying to take real, real sort of advantage of the fact that we do have this, this tool, these NDCs, the, the Paris Agreement as a whole, bringing this dialogue together and being able to think about if countries have made these big pledges, if they've made these bold moves, how can we treat them as investment strategies? How can we treat them as a way to really crowd in, you know, and, and we talked about the 100 billion and there's there's the 100 billion, but there's also vast amounts of resources that are, that are being uh, available nationally. You know, 72% of climate finance in the world is, it operates where it was sourced. And I think being able to think about how we can, cause this transformation through taking a look at these investment strategies across society. Um, and I know Gonzalo has a 
ton of fantastic uh, uh, statistics about how, how much momentum there is around this and all of these players around the table that, that maybe aren't the traditional players that are coming into this space and, and a part of this transformation. Thanks a lot, Cassie. And I, and I think that's a, a really great transition. Uh, so thanks for, for making my job easy there. Um, I mean, so far, we've, we've really focused, uh, understandably, I think the, the conversation has focused largely on climate action at the country level. And that historically has been the case in the UNFCCC. But over the years, there's been an increasing focus on non-state actors, including the private sector, needing to play a critical role in, in terms of raising climate ambition and also to create the space to implement the targets that, that are set at the national level. So turning to you, Gonzalo, are non-state actors delivering and, and what are your expectations for, for COP26? Well, thanks so much, Kerry, and, and of course, thanks for CTV and, uh, and EDF for, for setting a, a, the topic and the topic meaning COP26 and beyond. Right. I love the idea that uh, you're offering the possibility that we don't fall again in the trap of positioning this absurd idea that every COP can become like a moment where someone will turn off the oven and the crisis will get solved. Right. And, and I think that many times we have fallen into, the, into that trap. But let me also question one, uh, one element that was in your, in your reflection. You said, understandably, we speak about the importance of, of the government, like, probably for billions of people in the world that not necessarily understandably. We're failing on connecting a global problem that is absolutely embedded on development and the global economy, thinking that it will be about 190 something countries like defining something and that would be it, right? And, and I think that that's part of what we are now trying to solve or offering a new way and that's, that's related also to the, what, what the Secretary General mentioned as a multi-stakeholder inclusive multilateralism. <clears throat> well, the non-state actors that by the way, it's, it's not nice to get named by what you're not, what you're not hopefully like all the time we find a new name for that, but those non-state actors are definitely delivering and making a lot more than we are sometimes aware of. And this is not usually reflected in our reports about climate and, 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 and as, as Casey was reflecting very well, like how, how do we connect the NDCs with all of this that is happening in each of the countries of the world? And, uh, and, and what is worse is not taken into account in our projections of the future. So we fail not only on showing what this floor called the NDCs and where we are as the picture of the climate uh, crisis and the climate solutions. We fail on seeing this as a video, not, not as a static picture. If you compare to where we were, if you go back and try to analyze what were the projections that we were doing two, three, five, ten 10 years ago, but also we tend to fail again on projecting to the future. So that's part of what we're trying to offer with very concrete action coming from the non-state actors. But please don't get me wrong. We are living the most challenging existential crisis of humanity and the science is totally right when saying that uh, we're losing this race and, and, and not in track to stay under 1.5 degrees and we need to accelerate climate action. But we need to combine those. At the same time, we know it is important to acknowledge, acknowledge as I said, that we have made a lot of progress in the last years the mo in the moment of COVID, uh, the level of ambition, the level of commitments are growing really exponentially. And we're starting to reach breakthroughs in critical sectors of the economy. Again, please take the positive and optimistic side of my phrases, also balance with the uh, urgency and the, and, and the understanding that we're not still on track. Uh, I would like to start with, for example, with the power sector, uh, because these days we think uh, renewable energies are business as usual. We don't take them as an innovation anymore. And we know we will face our cold sooner than we expected, as, uh, as Kai mentioned, like it's, it's uh, so, so, uh, uh, as Rachel uh, mentioned. So, so we, we know that high energy, energy consumers like Google, Microsoft, and, and many other companies around the world have already reached their targets to get 100% renewable energy. Where were we in that topic 10 years ago? What was the projection that we were thinking for 2020 or 2021? Something similar is starting to happen in transport in the last 
Five years, we've seen cities, regions, companies, uh, all committing to different types of zero emission vehicles. There is, a, of course, a massive transition to electromobility underway, and, and we will definitely face our combustion engine much, much sooner than we thought, and, and even much sooner than we think today. And we will, uh, we, we also get used to, to live now with bike lanes, uh, walkable cities, and many other ways in which we're changing mobility, not only in the global north, also being properly landed or again, slow, but started to get landed in the global south. Uh, you know, probably as, as part of our strategy as the UN high level champions with my dear friend, Nigel Topping, we launched these three global campaigns, the race to zero around mitigation, the race to resilience around adaptation and resilience, and with Mark Carney, the global financial alliance for net zero, GFANS. But we also promote the 2030 breakthroughs to accelerate the transition at the sectorial level, because we cannot fail on positioning the vision in 2050. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, it's like it, it's, a, it's a risk on just thinking that this is something that we will do in the 40s. We need to show what needs to happen now. So we position the breakthroughs on 2030, mapping 30 sectors of the economy, uh, and, and also positioning the idea of 20% of the critical actors of each of those sectors committing to race to zero as the ambition breakthrough, but then defining what's the ambition outcome uh, of each of those sectors. No, we're measuring 30 sectors of the economy. We define when we launch them in January that we will reach probably Glasgow with 10 of them. We have announced this week that we already reached 15 of them in terms of 20% of the major actors of that, of that sector of the economy. And that is a tipping point that then is translated in very specific transformation in our real life. Of course, we expect, yep. Sorry, Gonzalo, I mean, uh, if I could just interrupt with a couple of quick questions. I mean, that's, sure. that's really fantastic. And, uh, and I, I, I definitely stand corrected on the, on the importance. I think what you said really links very clearly to what Rachel was saying earlier in terms of the disconnection between the geopolitics and what's needed. So this sort of, um, I don't know what to call it now, if I don't call it non-state and maybe uh, sub-national action. It's the is, ambition loop. It's the activation the of loop. the ambition loop. But you mentioned you mentioned the initiatives and the breakthroughs. I have two questions. First of all, the first question is, is there still time for, for organizations, cities, companies to be involved? And secondly, what are the plans for those after COP26? Will they be part of the Paris ambition cycle? What, what's your thinking on that? Well, for, for the first question, uh, it's normally when we speak in a very uh, um, personal level with many leaders from all around the world, they will recognize that, that they, they are late and they would have loved to, to understand this before. So hopefully 10 times, uh, 10 years before. So So, there's always time. The time was yesterday, and uh, and 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 when it comes to be uh, be featured at COP, yeah, for for business you have exactly one week. So th September the thirtieth is the last moment when you can uh, you, you you can sign the pledge for being part of Race to Zero and then be featured at COP. But again, it's COP twenty six and beyond. Okay, let's let's understand that we have to continue working with it. I don't I don't mind if you. If, 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 if the promise or the idea of pledging comes on January 2022, the important thing is that you pledge, plan, proceed, and publish the four Ps. You have to start working on it. Uh, and, and every moment uh, counts. So whenever you can join, you will be absolutely celebrated. Uh, when it comes to the plans um, beyond COP, you, you might know that the role of the high level champions was renovated by the parties in Madrid for another five year cycle. So initially in, in Paris, it was defined for a five-year mandate, then extended. And the parties also asked us to seek for ways to improve the Marrakesh partnership as this platform in which we collaborate with the different coalitions of non-party stakeholders. So as part of this, we've launched a feedback process in 2020, and we're now working under a five-year plan that will be able to support future champions and help the climate community to accelerate the transition, transition in this critical decade through this formal bridge that is the role of the, of the uh, high level champions. This plan includes, of course, the strengthening and the interaction of these three global campaigns and all sectorial breakthroughs. We are now, um, and next week we will have 
a, a webinar with Nigel where we will reflect on the consultation process that we had around Race to Zero, for example, asking for the community to help us on what can we improve for Race to Zero to keep on becoming the golden standard for net zero commitments. We're also reinforcing the way we can support the interrelationship between non-state actors and national governments. We know that the climate crisis requires a whole of society approach and, and we're building the basis of this new inclusive multilateralism the Secretary General is talking about. So that's part of what we are expecting that we part will be part of this agenda from um, right after COP26. Thanks so much, uh, Gonzalo, and, and you know, thanks for your energy. I think you 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 must have set a record for the longest-serving climate champion. Yes. So thank you a lot for your <laughs> for your energy and, and, and stamina. Um, and I hope you can stay on the end because we have, we have have some questions. If we have time, we'd like to come back to those. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like now to turn to to Bryony. Bryony, the the recent IPCC report set out in stark terms the challenges we face in terms of limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees centigrade and clearly technology will have a major role to play in achieving that aim. Do you have reasons to be optimistic about Glasgow and what do you think COP26 could do to accelerate uh, technological in innovation? Thanks, Kabe. Thank you for the invitation and thanks for uh, inviting me to be sharing this platform with these fantastic speakers. Um, I think my, my concern at the moment is it is possible to maintain optimism, but it's uh, it, it, even the Code Red report that came out from IPCC is probably an underestimate of, of the challenge, right? It's working off papers that are, that are lagging by several years, and um, we're seeing more and more evidence that some of the modelling is struggling to reproduce some of the actual uh, experienced events that we're actually seeing happening today. So if anything, um, you know, it's code deep red uh, is probably the reality that we're facing. So, but in the face of that, I think what is encouraging is that the, the, there's no negotiating with physics and the fact that this now, this global experiment that we've been running for decades is coming, you know, is coming home, uh, means that more and more people are joining the fight. And I get inundated with people asking me, okay, so what can I do? And how can I help? And what should I be doing with my talents? And that's from all sectors um, and all ages and all demographics. So the, the sense of humanity waking up and starting to collaborate to take action is growing. And it's uh, probably about 30 years too late, but it's still uh, possible to make progress. And why, you know, multilateral, um, organizations like the UNFCCC are so important is that we need, a, we need a place to come together and create a framework within which we can make a plan and start to act. And I hope that um, we'll start to see increasingly in COPs more talk about how do we link the activities of, of the environment ministers to, to the real economy, bringing in conversations with different ministers, different aspects of government and bringing in legislators and, and sub-state actors so that it becomes a real, uh, real collaboration at every level. And in terms of the question around technology, uh, you know, this, it's clear that there's, we're not starting from a standing start. We've had more than 20 years of, of policy that has led to technologies coming down in costs. So you know, that's, the, that's the real root of optimism in that you can now, with confidence, say in very many countries, the cheapest way to add electricity to your grid is, is through renewables, not through fossil. And that the technologies are coming, continuing to improve and higher and higher penetration levels are possible. So that's changed the dynamic from one where there was a sense that there was a burden we all had to share, that we were all facing a cost to having to act on climate. And now it's just simply not the case. It's now cheaper and better for countries to do it in a clean way rather than go through the fossil route. The same is happening, and because I mentioned this in electrification of transport, huge strides in tech, battery technology and, and EV technology means that that's, for, for people who drive many miles, it's gonna be cheaper to do that on electric than it is on fossil. So there isn't really any use of fossil that couldn't be replaced with an engineering solution that's available today. And there are now places where you can do that and it saves you money. So that's gonna fundamentally change the politics of solving climate change. And that gives me great hope. Um, but if, I don't want to go back to a negative, but we're starting late. And so we're going to have to use all the technologies that are available. And I think I personally believe that means we, we definitely need to 
increase our capacities of uh, deploying renewables, but we also should be looking at nuclear again. And um, we should be looking at whether CCS can be used effectively for some of the harder to decarbonize sectors. And we should be looking at large scale removals. We've got to see something that takes down the stock of, of the uh, emissions already in the atmosphere, and whether that's um, you know, human augmented uh, bio sinks or natural sinks or technologies. Um, these are gonna have to be a big feature of what we need to do. So you just look at the, 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 the pace at which we need to now move and the vertiginous drop in emissions we need to stay uh, in a cl safe climate, we can't afford to rule anything out. And we've got to find effective policies that de-risk investment in these technologies and bring them into quickly into, into being. So um, what I'm hoping from Glasgow is that we, it's uh, a moment when everyone realizes that we're all in this together, but the shift away from seeing this as a burden to something about collaboration to seek collective gain is the one I'd really like to see. And then real world conversations about how you de-risk investment at scale in the technology we know are gonna be able to solve the problem. Thanks, Bryony. I mean, I'm really struck from the, the interventions that we've had so far that there's been a, a very clear thread that is focusing very much on implementation and action, which is, uh, which is, very, which is very strongly coming through. I hope you don't mind if I just take the liberty uh, of having you on and, um, uh, and, and take you a little bit closer to home in, in relation to the situation in the UK. I mean, you were very closely involved in the design of the, of the groundbreaking 2008 Climate Change Act in the UK, which is now being emulated in, in other countries in terms, of, uh, in terms of its model. And in the last few years, we've seen that transition from coal to renewables in the UK that you talk about with some of the first days of coal-free electricity generation since the Industrial Revolution. Do you think the UK is leading by example through domestic action? Could it do more and, and, and where could it do more? I think on the, on the sectoral decarbonisation, it's, it's doing okay. Um, you, start, you always have to start with electricity because it's such an enabler of other, of other forms of decarbonisation. And on that, we've definitely brought down the carbon intensity of our grid substantially, thanks to building out massively into renewables, sustaining our nuclear and um, working on you know, efficiency. So yeah, we're doing well on that. The electrification of transport has been a lot slower, but it's getting going now with the ban on sale of ICE vehicles. But there are still huge segments of the economy where there isn't policy, and where there isn't that de-risking mechanism that means the private sector can really start to make money doing the right thing. So we've got a lot, we've got further to go. On agriculture, which is you know quarter of quarter of the emissions that people tend to forget about, um, we're, we're rewriting our cap subsidy um, proposals so that we can reward farmers for doing the right thing by the climate. That, that could be massively significant. I think the UK is underplaying its role there, and I think it could be a blueprint for other countries to do subsidy reform. Um, but then the big blind spot is that all of these are about the demand side or sort of lower down the uh, hierarchy of energy supply chains. When it comes to upstream, famously, the UK is considering opening a new coal, coal mine and opening up its oil and gas fields in the North Sea, uh, just at the same time as hosting COP. And I think that's the, the next big challenge is realizing that you only really get deep, deep cuts in emissions if you cut with both sides of the scissors. You have to replace the demand for fossil and you have to cut off the supply. And the cutting off of the supply has to be a negotiated process. I strongly believe this has got, to, if you want an orderly transition out of the fossil era, you're gonna to have to have countries take bold stances and then negotiate with other countries to get us off um, this continued investment in what should now be a, an industry that has no future. Thanks, thanks Brian. I mean, you've listed a, a lot of sectors there, which I think will be challenges to be faced by um, by many countries around the world so you know an another opportunity potentially for the COP26 presidency to lead beyond Glasgow um, thank you very much uh, Bryony, Gonzalo, Cassie to all of you uh, again I hope you can stay until the end and, and if we have time to field some questions so in this next segment I'd really like to focus more closely on the multilateral system and I was really struck in particular that in none of the interventions that we've had so far has anyone mentioned negotiations in relation to COP26, um, which uh, from a former negotiator is, is probably a good sign. But um, I think Rachel mentioned in passing, uh, but it hasn't really featured at all. 
So turning to Richard, um, Richard, the last time I saw you in person on the panel was when you were on the podium at COP21 in Paris. So we've heard uh, from others that there are high hopes and expectations for COP26 and ambition. Are multilateral institutions fit for purpose to deliver? Is the Paris Agreement working? What are the main challenges for Glasgow? Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the invitation to be here. I, I, I must say, I found the discussion so far really um, wide ranging, comprehensive, and, and covering so much of the breadth of the issue. I, it's been a, a really great one. So, hats off to you for pulling together the panel. Um, maybe starting with expectations, I have to say the expectations for Glasgow I find very worrisome, uh, partly because they're so high. Uh, and it's always difficult to fulfill high expectations. We can think of examples in the past, which give some of us at least nightmares. Um, but what I find even more troubling is that these high expectations are combined with extremely undefined outcomes. Uh, one hears lots of talk about saving the world and a turning point or some opaque references to agreements when as a, as, a, as a process nerd, none of these are on the agenda. Uh, and it's very then difficult for any process to fulfill these kind of undefined objectives. So I, I think it might be useful if we worked a bit at defining what the, the Glasgow success might look like. But before going there, um, you were asking about is multilateralism fit for purpose? And I think the purpose of multilateral institutions can change over time. Um, I've argued up to now that uh, the climate multilateral negotiations, in particular the UNFCCC, uh, if you look at the functions that you want such a process to deliver, um, that it's actually done a pretty good job. I mean, you want from this kind of a process, first of all, treaties, principles, goals, and th those we have, we have three pretty good treaties coming out of the UNFCC negotiations. Um, you need, you want uh, systems, data, transparency, accountability systems. Uh, again, and in the climate regime, we have a pretty good uh, 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 case, uh, uh, certainly compared to a number of other uh, regimes. Um, there has to be a role, and here I guess is one where it's fallen a bit short, is in promoting financial support, not so much delivering, but facilitating and encouraging. Uh, but I think it's also true that in the wider multilateral system beyond the UNFCCC, there's much more to do, and we might come back to that uh, a bit later. But in this list of functions, you'll notice I didn't include saving the world. Um, I think multilateralism, I very much see it as a process or a system that's to help governments achieve what they want to do and to do that more effectively. Um, I'm a real skeptic when it comes down to arguments that multilateral processes will make governments do things that they don't want to do. Uh, it, it, the pressure helps, uh, yes, that's true. But multilateral, the UN, the UNFCCC is certainly not going to make governments do something they wouldn't do otherwise, certainly not the major players. So in that regard, uh, I think it's tricky to blame multilateral organizations for the situation that we're in today. I would argue that the lack of ambition uh, that we are now having to deal with so urgently is not due to the failings of the multilateral system, but due to the failures of governments and of business, despite the progress that has been made, they're still not doing nearly enough, not what they have committed to do and not what they know they have to do. Um, the, that, that then, uh, so what does all this mean for Glasgow? Uh, I think it's good then to look at these deliverables or defining success of Glasgow uh, through two, two lenses. The first is on the negotiations. You mentioned we hadn't spoken about the negotiations in, in, in any depth. Um, and while I've been out of it for quite a long time, it does seem to me that it would be useful to give a bit of uh, depth to what is in this negotiation package. 
And I mean, first of all, there is no treaty, there is no big A agreement. Uh, and oftentimes in the commentaries, I think this is assumed, but it's actually not the case, uh, which makes it more difficult to then define or then uh, hold up a, a, a big success. We, we, we know, we hope there will be a series of decisions on rules, on reportings. People have already mentioned the carbon markets. Um, and all of these together, I think, uh, will be important, but uh, not what you would call earth shaking or, or future saving. Um, I think a real interesting question is, will there be a meaningful decision on targets for 2030 and uh, net zero by 2050, which a couple of the predecessor panelists have already mentioned? To me, this would be symbolically very important, but we have to keep in mind that we have lots of targets and what we really need are action plans. Um, I would identify as a key element of this, the decisions on post 20 or, or the, the kicking off the processes for post 20, uh, 2025 finance objectives and for the global stock take, which we'll hear a bit about later, I think. Um, and I think all of these process outcomes are not super sexy. Um, but they are important for the integrity of the system and for moving forward um, and, and, and will help, but only slightly with, with ambition. The second thing that to me is, is more interesting and more important, and it's much more Gonzalo's business, which he spoke about earlier, and that's this idea of the COP as an event uh, or a moment in time. I, I listened carefully to Boris Johnson speaking yesterday when he talked about the COP as a turning point. And I think there's really a lot here that needs to be focused on in judging whether or not it's been a success. First of all, we'll have world leaders coming for the first couple of days for the summit. What they say will be really, really important. Uh, will they be making new announcements? Will they be raising ambition, new NDCs and funding uh, uh, pledges? Um, and then there's the whole array of activities that Gonzalo was speaking about and to me, which really needs to be brought out and showcased uh, to the greatest extent possible of new initiatives, coalitions uh, to push for real action, whether it's on you know, coal or fossil fuel subsidies, border tax adjustments, methane, all of these things which then don't need to be negotiated by 194 countries and agreed by consensus, but which those who want to move can move and drive the agenda forward. To me, that's a really critical element of defining whether or not we will be able to say at the end of uh, COP26, that we have kept uh, 1.5 uh, degrees uh, within reach. And so, so I think it's also, it's gonna be tricky when the president of the COP si uh, uh, sums everything up at the end because there's not gonna be a big bang. It's going to be how to make a series of little bangs add up to a big success. Thanks, Richard. I mean, that, that's uh, really, really helpful and, um, and uh, words of wisdom there. I mean, I was really struck by what you said about multilateral institutions being essentially in place to deliver, a, to put in place a process to deliver what countries are ready to do. And it took me a long time as a negotiator to realize that we're not there to negotiate ambition, <laughs> which, I, which I was under the misapprehension for a long time. But also I think the point that you made where there, there seems there's a real conflation between the COP as a process and the COP as an event. And that seems to me a, a risk point around the relatively, well, important, but um, as we've said, nobody has mentioned them, the negotiating issues that could still derail the COP despite all of this other stuff going on. I mean, looking beyond COP26 uh, and, and pivoting towards this translation, this sort of transition from negotiations to implementation, uh, and, and the sort of cycle to raise ambition beyond COP26 as we, as we move towards 2022 and 2023. Is the, is the UNFCCC well placed for that transition? Are there things that, um, that uh, in the process that need to be strengthened to facilitate that transition from, from negotiations to implementation? Or, or are we seeing a, a transition towards COPs being much more event focused rather than, than process focused in the future? I think it's both of the above, actually. I mean, I, I, I uh, believe that the, 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 the uh, COPs as events are now firmly 
um, established and will continue to be uh, really sort of landmark events, although perhaps not everyone. Uh, we can perhaps look forward to 2023 as the next big COP because of the, of the global stock take. Um, and in fact, there may be some health in that because I, I don't think in, in an implementation world that you need a big bang conference every year. But uh, as any, anyone who has worked at process or in, 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 in civil services internationally or domestically knows that keeping the machine running is really important so that you can deliver in the long term. And I, I think that there's important things that need to be done uh, in, through, in and through the UNFCC process going forward. Um, perhaps they're not uh, going to be in the limelight, but it, it will be critical to getting to the end of the, uh, of the journey. And in, in that process, help push governments to be a bit more ambitious than they have been. And in that sense, uh, the, the, the whole reporting and review accountability system is a very important. I hope it can be made more robust and that the pressure from that can help. Um, clearly, much more needs to be done to put the spotlight on finance uh, so that we can uh, sort of help uh, CASE achieve even more uh, by having uh, better NDC implementation, because in many cases, it's about implementation of NDCs. Um, the GST is going to be really important, I think, although I have to say, Based on my experience, I'm quite worried. It's very difficult to have a serious scientific technical discussion in a highly political multilateral process. Um, so again, maybe expectations management there. Um, the, I have, have, have had one nerdy idea, if I may. If I may. Uh, there's a very interesting article in the Framework Convention, Article 7.2C, which calls on the COP to, or it gives it the possibility to coordinate measures amongst interested parties. And I think in an age when we're talking about more coalitions of the willing and, and having groups of countries and, and uh, multi-sectoral initiatives, there may be some scope for giving some life to that that would help these kinds of initiatives achieve their, their success. And lastly, I think one of the one of the other panelists talked about the COP as a as a as a as an area where things come together. It's it's a it has an important function in bringing everyone together. And in that sense, as it has for thirty years uh, or twenty five years, it's helped kept the spotlight on the climate issue and on uh, ambition and urgency. But I think I I would want to make certainly inspired by what the others have said an important footnote that um, the UNFCCC is a very important part of the multilateral process on climate change, but by no means the only part. Uh, and uh, th there's, there, has always, there, has, there has been a debate, I think, going back many years uh, about to what extent things should be centralized there. And I, I'm, I'm not keen on that at all. I think, in fact, one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in now is that many other actors and centers of, uh, of power have not taken their responsibilities. They've, they've been able to say that's dealt with over there. And if we've learned anything in the last uh, decade, it's that we're not, climate change as an issue, the defining issue of the time is only gonna be solved by an all of government and all of multilateralism approach. Uh, so it takes everybody, all hands on deck if we're going to uh, deal with the problem in the way in the way that it needs to be. Many thanks, Richard, um, for really for pulling together what we've heard so far. And it was a, it was really nice to hear the convention quoted. It made me feel 10 years younger. So thank you for that. Um, I really hope you can stay until the end. Um, before bringing Lavania into the conversation. How are you done on you? Sorry, I've been muted, apologies. Sorry, before bringing um, Lavani into the conversation, I'd like to turn to you, our audience, to gauge your thoughts on prospects for COP26. Given what you've heard so far and events in recent days and months, how optimistic are you that COP26 will produce a, a high ambition outcome? So are you very optimistic, somewhat optimistic, or not at all optimistic? I'm not going to lead you on that, but you've got about 
60 seconds or so to um, to register your your thoughts before that's taken down. So um, turning now to um, to Lavania, who's uh, who, 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 if anyone's me memorized Article 7.2C of the Convention, it will be Lavania. Um, but uh, Lavania, there, there are clearly very high expectations for COP26, and you, you, you've heard Richard mention the, the convention, the, the agreement, uh, and the role of multilateral institutions. I mean, in terms of the, the sort of formal outcome from COP26, the so-called Decision 1CP26, what would you want to see on ambition in that? And what do you think we need to see on ambition on that, Lavanya? Uh, thank you, Kave, uh, also for inviting me to be part of this really tremendous and terrific panel. Um, it's been a hugely enriching hour uh, and a bit so far. Uh, as a fellow process nerd, uh, I cannot but agree with Richard. Um, we certainly do need to temper our expectations of COP26. But uh, what I'd like to do is to distinguish between what is on the agenda of the COP and what is within the wider landscape of ambition or the wider diplo diplomacy of ambition, as it were. And I think what we need from COP26 um, as part of the outcome of COP26 is a connection between those two, between the wider landscape of ambition, the COP is an event, as it were, um, and what is actually on the agenda of the COP. We need to bring some things back onto the agenda, perhaps through 1CP26, uh, as you say. So let me flesh this out a little bit. There is a very simple, intuitive, and obvious ask of the wider landscape of ambition or the diplomacy of ambition um, of the COP26 moment, as it were, that it should put us on a pathway to meeting the well below two degrees temperature goal and even 1.5 degree temperature goal identified in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. But what would it take within the process, within the COP26 uh, negotiating context to actually do that? First, of course, new and updated NDCs from those that are yet to submit them. Um, about 118 countries representing 50% of emissions uh, have submitted them. Um, we, these are not, uh, they, even though they've submitted them, they don't sort of step up the ambition sufficiently um, to get us where we need to get. Um, the synthesis report um, uh, that the UNFCCC Secretariat produced uh, on and published on uh, September 17th, just a few days ago, indicates that implemented NDCs will put us on track to about 16% above 2010 levels in 2030. And according to the special report, IPCC special report 1.5, we actually need to be 45% uh, below for a 1.5 degree uh, a pathway and 25% below 2010 levels in 2030 for a two degree pathway. So clearly we are, far, we are far away from that as far as the new and updated NDCs are concerned. So a decision that highlights this gap, focuses on this gap and encourages uh, ambition in the short, short term rather than in the long term um, is very important, I think, element that we need to be looking for from the outcome of uh, COP26. The second, uh, I think, element that I would highlight is alignment of these nationally determined contributions, the short term uh, contributions, as it were, with mid-century net zero greenhouse gas targets. And these targets, the mid-century net zero targets, need to be anchored in the Paris Agreement processes. So 131 countries uh, or thereabouts have actually announced or adopted net zero targets. And a recent analysis in Nature Climate Change suggests that um, if these targets are actually implemented, they put us on pathway to 2 to 2.4 degrees by 2100. Currently implemented policies actually put us on track to 2.9 to 3.2 degrees centigrade, and the pledges submitted to the Paris Agreement put us on track to 2.4 to 2.9 degrees centigrade. But for these targets, the net zero mid-century targets, to be um, credible, to be accountable, and to be fair, they need to be aligned with the short-term nationally determined contributions, and they need to be anchored in the Paris Agreement processes. Um, and this is uh, something Decision 1 CP26 could do. It could create hooks for anchoring these long-term mid-century net zero targets into the Paris Agreement processes. And we have hooks within the Paris Agreement to do this. We have Article 419 um, on you know, long-term low greenhouse gas develop, uh, development strategies. Uh, only some countries have submitted them. We need to encourage all countries to submit their long-term low greenhouse gas development strategies 
incorporating their mid-century net zero targets and aligning them with their NDCs for the, uh, for the, for the 2030 timeframe. I would also suggest- um, Sorry, sorry. Lavani, if I could just pick up on one point you made, which is really interesting, I, uh, which, which is the disparity between where the, the, the pledges take us and where the implemented policies and mm -hmm. just as a personal reflection, I would have thought having a greater emphasis on tracking where implemented policies take us might be a, a much more productive way going forwards to actually bring bring parties together towards finding solutions. But that, I just was abusing my uh, my moderator role to make that reflection. A very a very quick question because we're running out of time. I'm really sorry, but. Um, we've heard lots of people, we've heard Todd, uh, we've heard Richard and others, uh, Cassie, referring to the ambition cycle under the Paris Agreement and the global stock take. What, what is the global stock take? How, it, how will it work and, and what does it need to achieve? Um, we've got two minutes on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Calvin. Three minutes, three minutes. Okay. Thank you for that extension. <laughs> So the global stock tick for schedule for 2023 is the sort of first official moment of reckoning as it were for the 2015 Paris Agreement, which does rely on iteratively more progressive and more ambitious uh, sort of NDCs from states over time. Now the Paris Agreement rulebook identifies some components of the global stock take, mostly focused on information collection, technical assessment and consideration of outputs. Many elements of the state yet to be determined, and some of the processes for those will, will begin in, um, in, in COP26, at COP26. To me, I think the most um, important part of uh, designing the global stock day going forward is, um, is the outcome that we're looking for from, from the global stock day in 2023. And I think that outcome should be one that sets its sights on environmental effectiveness, not just an institutional effectiveness. It shouldn't just be looking at whether uh, parties are complying with their, um, with their NDC within the context of the Paris Agreement, but it should actually, and this is something that Todd referred to right in the beginning that I uh, found very um, insightful as well, is that we should be looking at the evolving science and some links between the evolving science and uh, and environmental effectiveness. So perhaps what we've identified in Article 2 is not sufficient. Perhaps we need something more. And the evolving science, the latest reports from the IPCC, this should frame our conversations around the global stock take so that what we're looking for is stabilizing the climate, not necessarily just uh, looking at particular provisions of the Paris Agreement to see to what extent they, we've collected sufficient information to be able to tell whether states are implementing um, their NDCs. We need to go much beyond that. We need to identify the key functions of the global stock take, and we need to go beyond, um, beyond as many speakers today have highlighted, we need to go beyond the state-centric focus of the UNFCC process and create a bridge between what um, Gonzalo called multi-stakeholder uh, multi multilateralism and uh, the UNFCC process. Thank you. That's really helpful, uh, Lavania. You've uh, you've set the COP26 presidency a lot of homework. I'm sure there'll be Great some time. of them watching watching this now. Um, so I, I'm going to take the liberty of, uh, of bringing on Kelly Kazaya, who's uh, who's the vice president at EDF, where she leads EDF's work on efforts to promote more ambition and more ambitious and effective global climate policy. Um, Kelly, following on from Lavania. CTUS and EDF are working on a project that relates to the UNFCCC GST process. Can you briefly tell us something about that? I absolutely can. I just saw Todd raise his hand, so I thought we would just give him the opportunity. Really ah, Todd, sorry, I missed your hand. Did well, you I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to state my question and I'm going to leave it to Lavanya to, uh, to answer it later on and this panel or to send me an email because <laughs> so I don't want to take uh, Kelly's time but I'm I'm the question that I have is whether the notion of the global global stock take digging into environmental effectiveness as distinguished from simply looking at whether the uh, the um, various elements of, of the Paris agreement are being uh, are being implemented is there a, is is there an open question uh, about uh, in, in the minds of parties, whether the global stock take should be looking, looked at, at this in this narrow, unuseful bureaucratic way versus what it was clearly intended to be. <laughs> so, but now, now let's turn it back to Kelly. 
Levana, you have you have time for a, a, a team go. So I'm happy to concede the time. Um, well, I mean, it would seem obvious. To, it it would seem obvious to us that we should be looking at in this sort of broad environmental effectiveness framing. Uh, but this is a multilateral UN process. Uh, the global stock take is at a very real risk of turning into a checkbox exercise. And I think what I'm suggesting is that we try and create a framework which allows it to be more than just a standard UN sort of review process. Just uh, just full disclosure on that, Lavanya is working both with, uh, with Kelly and I and others to, to answer exactly the question you posed, Todd, which is, how can it be made more effective? And so I really hope that you'll be involved in that talk. But Kelly, can you tell tell us more about that? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I mean, basically that's the whole thing right there. Thanks, Kavi, I'm delighted to be here today. And I wanna thank you and to thank our panel for joining and creating such an awesome discussion. I think Lavanya and Todd have just made my life much easier by describing the tension about the global stock take um, process. So, I'll be brief, and I know we're running out of time. C2ES and EDF, with support from Quechta, are undertaking a joint initiative to help shape the Paris Agreement's global stock take. The aim of the joint effort is to make sure that global stock take makes a real contribution to ambition under the Paris Agreement, that it's an integral part of the ambition cycle and not just another box ticking exercise. So I think one of the main things is we need to we need to make sure they have the right inputs and the right outputs, and we need to bring the UNF the work of the UNF to the real economy, as Brian mentioned. Um, this year in the project, we're focusing our attention on identifying near-term scalable actions that are one, aligned with the Paris Agreement's long-term goals for the environmental integrity, and two, those that can be advanced in the context of the global stock take, um, given the limitations and the framing of the stock take. In the next stage and throughout the lead up to the first global stock take in 2023, we're in we have a detailed plan to engage governments, experts, and stakeholders to build support for an opportunities framework to facilitate those inputs into and outcomes from the first global stock take. Throughout the project, we're gonna be working to ensure that the global stock take has a strong focus on opportunities to scale up climate ambition, across mitigation, adaptation, and finance, and we're keenly aware of the connections and the need to maintain a balance here. We're gonna be taking into account many of the issues we heard about today, the role and urgency for major economies, the balance in terms of ambition, impact, and opportunity for other parties, the role of non-state actors, and the importance of innovation and technology. And all of this has to be framed by the role and limitations of the UNFCCC process and the ultimate responsibility of the parties involved. So I think Richard, highlighted these points very well, and I don't, I don't need to repeat that. So even though the focus of the project is on the, is on the inside baseball, is on the Paris Agreement, we're also designing it so that we can have impact through broader collective effort outside the UNFCCC, the real world dynamics that you and Gonzalo spoke about. We're not trying to duplicate efforts underway. I think people would think we're trying to do all this um, from the bottom up, but what we want to do is take the work of Gonzalo and the Race to Zero the Oxford initiative that Todd mentioned, the innovation happening in electricity markets, financial markets, and indeed carbon markets, something very near and dear to my heart, um, as highlighted by Bridie and Rachel, and the work and analysis of the UNDP and its climate process. I can't name all of the initiatives today, but there are many that we're looking to, to draw from. And then ultimately the aim is for the framework we're creating to bring these pathways, innovation, and key opportunities to decision makers directly in the context of the GST. So that they focus on the opportunities and not only the burdens of climate action, and so that they're better equipped to progress ambition through enhanced NDT, NDCs and through finance and adaptation action. So we look forward to meeting any of you over the course of our project, and we certainly welcome your input. Back to you, Kabe, that was fast, but I try to get time. Thanks, that's very well done. And we've dropped some uh, links into the chat, I think, if people have questions. I just see that Bryony has her hand up. Bryony, you have 60 seconds. Oh, that was an accidental hand. I cut off Kelly for, for, for no reason, apologies. So um, it just really uh, it just really remains uh, for me to really thank all of our panelists and, uh, and also the audience. Um, I have, I have the, the, the results of the poll um, that we had earlier. And I'm very pleased to say that the vast majority of you are um, somewhat optimistic about COP26. Um, uh, so that 65% of you are somewhat optimistic. 
6% are very optimistic and 28% not optimistic at all. So we, we still have four weeks to, uh, to make the glass half full rather than half empty. Um, thank you for all the people who submitted comments in the chat. I'm sorry we ran out of time, but hopefully there was some interaction in the chat. I wasn't able to monitor that. I hope you've all found the discussion useful and informative. And, and really, thank you so much to Todd, Rachel, Cassie, Gonzalo, Bryony, Lavania, and Kelly and others, and, and the CTUS and EDF team. The a recording of the event will be available on the CTUS YouTube channel, which you should be able to find. Again, I think there's a link in the chat and we'll follow up by email. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you.